Welcome to SVG TV News for Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. I'm Investor Bowens with the details. Following a meeting between the Transport Board and the Minibus and Taxi Associations, Cabinet will make a decision on approving an increase in bus and taxi fares. According to Acting Prime Minister and Minister of Transport and Works Montgomery Daniel, a written request was made to the Transport Board outlining the recommendations for an increase. Preliminary discussions with government and the representative body will be held this Friday, after which the Transport Board will meet to put forward a final memorandum which is to be presented at Cabinet next Wednesday. Speaking on NBC's radio, NBC Radio's face-to-face -face program today, Minister Daniel acknowledges justification for the request in light of the constant increase in fuel prices in recent months. As you know that there has been constant increase in gas price and and that's you know within the last couple of of, of weeks up to months um the minibus and the taxi association has written to the ministry for an increase in bus fare taxi fare as well yeah. and uh, as the minister of course i summoned the transport board to meet with the bus minibus association and the taxi associations they have met, they made recommendations to the Transport Board as a minister with the Transport Board and representatives of the Minibus Association and the Taxi Association. Minister Daniel also says he is hoping that the discussions can be wrapped up quickly. And the matter is now before the Transport Board. Of which, uh, within a week or so, it should, have, it, should have, it should have come back to the ministry, but the... Commissioner of Police was out of state, and and um, he came back just 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 last week or so, and last weekend, and so he is in discussions with him since he came back. That he is having a meeting, or is, has scheduled a meeting with the the associations on Friday, so that the final requirements will be lodged in a memo to cabinet for wednesday i really want to get this out of the way mm -hmm. because i think it's it's um timely it's it's something of concern to all of us and so on friday of this week there's a meeting with the transport board st vincent and the grenadines economy is it is predicted to grow significantly over the next years this was revealed by Minister of Finance Camilla Gonzalez during a recent press conference. He says preliminary estimates indicate that for 2022 up to 2024, economic growth is estimated to be in the region of 5.5%. Minister Gonzalez notes the country endured a number of challenges including the COVID-19 pandemic, Hurricane Elsa, the eruption of La Sofre and prolonged drought conditions which resulted in the decline of economic growth. He stresses that these numbers are preliminary estimates and not guaranteed. This year, um, the preliminary estimates from the Ministry of Finance um, are that we will grow by over 5.5% this year, and that we will grow by over 5.5% next year, and that we will grow by about 5% the following year. Those are all preliminary estimates and there are a number of risks involved. Um, one of the primary risks involved is how long will inflation last and how long will the war in the Ukraine last? Not that the war in the Ukraine is directly affecting us so much so as the sanctions and the international response to the war in Ukraine is affecting us. And it's an important distinction to make because a lot of people might think that once the war ends, economy will uh, resume immediately but I suspect that the international community will maintain sanctions um, on Russia even beyond the end of the war in the Ukraine. Minister Gonzalez says while government was forced to borrow to mitigate the challenges from the volcanic eruption the terms and conditions for loan repayment are favorable. To borrow money that is highly concessional um, and that with long grace periods so we've borrowed money but we're in our grace period, so we're not paying that money back anytime soon. And the interest rate for that money is very, very low. Um, so while it is debt, technically speaking, 
uh, it is not constraining our fiscal space uh, to the extent that commercial borrowings would, would constrain our fiscal space. The Eastern Caribbean Currency Union had previously said, before COVID, that we, we as a currency union should get to 60% debt to GDP by the year 2030. Once COVID started, and we all borrowed in the OECS, um, we adjusted that target from 2030 to 2035, that we try to get to 60% debt to GDP by 2035. In the near term, our debt will increase because we're borrowing to build the port, we're borrowing to build the hospital. These are concessionary loans, but they're still debt. But the trajectory of our debt will continue to trend downwards after these initial borrowings. And, you know, God willing that we don't have another hurricane or, or major natural disaster, um, we, are, we will be on target to hit our 2035 um, debt uh, target. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has announced plans to re-examine the user fees for hospital services. This disclosure comes from Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Cuthbert Knight. During a press conference to update plans on the construction of the new acute care hospital at Arnersville, which is set to commence next year. Knight says the project will be a significant upgrade from the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital, noting a new hospital is needed to meet the growing health needs of the population. Knights also says the ministry has recognized the need for a different governance structure to bring the hospital in line with the operations of a modern state-of-the-art facility. He gives the assurance that the ministry is not concerned about running a hospital for profit. We'll also be looking at the fee structure at that hospital and one which could be consistent with um, the needs of the people. The idea here is not to um, have a hospital and run a hospital for profit. This is absolutely not the case. Um, it is, however, that we will look at what is the present um, fee structure of the hospital in terms of the um, user fee system and have something which is more consistent with a, with, with a modern hospital. Knight adds the ministry intends to provide tertiary health care services at the new facility. One of the outstanding hallmarks of this project is also to look at the introduction of some tertiary health care. Now, I don't think that most persons would have dreamt of the day when this country would have been offering hemodialysis care. This is a service that people journeyed outside of St. Vincent to obtain. I don't think that persons would have fixed their minds on the fact that we could also have embarked on the provision of some aspect of oncology care through um, chemotherapy services here. More than a year after the April 2021 eruption of La Sophia, residents in North Leeward are still awaiting assistance for the repair and rebuilding of their homes. Parliamentary representative for the area and Minister of Tourism and Culture, Carlos James, is calling on residents to exercise patience as government continues its repair and rebuilding program. His comments were made during a tour of North Windward to view the progress of the rebuilding work in the area. Minister James reveals lands have been surveyed for construction of new houses and he adds the repair program will continue. Similarly to North Windward, we will be doing some construction in, in North Leeward as well. Um, persons who would have had their um, houses compromised um, in, in sites um, in Cumberland, for instance, we're looking at some, some lands we have surveyed there to construct some, some houses. And also we have um, done an extensive um, repair program in the North Leeward area as well, similar to North Windward in terms of rehabilitation for persons in the red and orange zones, uh, which is continuing. So there are persons who are still yet to um, receive that, that sort of assistance with, with rehabilitation of their houses and, and, the, and the roofs. Um, but we're asking them to exercise some patience as the, the, the builders are moving through and, and ensuring that they have enough materials on stock to continue to repair work. And this is in fact taking place as we speak. And um, you know, it, it is really a government responding to the, the challenges brought on by the, the explosive eruption of the last of the volcano. Um, significantly, we, we intend to spend a lot more resources. Um, we have 150 houses that are likely to come from Venezuela as well, and which will be spread across um, North Windward, North Leeward, and other constituencies to provide an, um, suitable accommodation for persons um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. 
St. Vincent and the Grenadines Embassy in Taiwan celebrated its third anniversary on Monday on August 8th. SVG's ambassador to the Republic of China on Taiwan, Her Excellency Andrea Bowman, speaking at a ceremony to commemorate the occasion on Tuesday, lauded the work of the SVG's embassy in Taiwan in its third year. Ambassador Bowman describes the anniversary celebrations as an exciting time for the embassy, which was officially opened on August 8, 2019 in Taipei. Three years ago, almost to the day, a number of you were in this very room when our Prime Minister, along with the then Vice President Shen, cut the ribbon to declare the opening of our embassy. And in this regard, I must specifically mention the instrumentality of the Excellency, the Dean of our Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Jasmine Huggins, who is unable to be with us today. And our cultural ambassador, Heli Carr, who is thankfully here with us this afternoon. Thank you, ladies. You, in particular, stood out and stood with us then as you stand with us now. The ceremony was attended by dignitaries, Vincentian students studying in Taiwan, cultural ambassador Peggy Carr and Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez, as well as the visiting delegation to Taiwan. Dr. Gonzalez used the opportunity to point to the deep ties between the Republic of China on Taiwan and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We have just gone through in our country the period of dislocation period of awesome challenges, convulsions, COVID, 32 volcanic eruptions in April last year, Hurricane Elsa, the first of the Atlantic hurricane season last year, followed by the short drop then the global turmoil exacerbated by the war in Ukraine and all the adverse knock-on effects. And these challenges have come upon us not of our own making, but we have to address on November 1st, 2021, the Embassy received the Republic of China Chamber of Commerce Golden Merchants Award for being the most outstanding foreign embassy and mission in Taiwan. Project coordinator of the Volcanic Eruption Project, Roxanne John, says the Emergency Operations Center Design and Management Workshop will equip participants with the ability to respond to disasters. She was at this time addressing the opening ceremony of the workshop, which was held at the National Emergency Management Organization headquarters yesterday. I'm quite happy. Since last year, we were working very close with Nemo and, and the team to really make sure that this project addresses some of the critical issues when it comes to disaster preparedness. And I'm sure that at the end of these three days, that we will all be more better equipped and ready to respond because, of course, we are, we are in hurricane season, but of, of, of course there are many other disasters that can take place and we are all to be prepared. In-country lead project coordinator with World Bank Decima Korea outlined the World Bank history of support for the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Korea commends Nemo on their work during the eruption and notes there are some gaps that need to be improved, adding that the workshop will address these issues. And we, and we need to commend them with whatever little resources and the, that Nemo possessed, Nemo did very well. The people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines as well stood tall along with Nemo. And it, notwithstanding all the trials and tribulations that Nemo went through and the country, I dare say, the process showed up some gaps. So it performed well, given whatever little resources it had, but it showed some gaps. 
and we are hoping that at the end of this workshop, that the, the, which is aimed to identify and to make recommendations as to how these gaps could be filled which have been identified. And so we are hoping that the persons who are coming here, that you will be fully engaged and that you will understand and recognize that this, recognize, sorry, that this is an important part in terms of our disaster risk reduction, our disaster risk management in this country. And we will do well as we do our best. Lead facilitator Ascentra Nazaro says his team is honored to be part of the sessions that would provide recommendation for disaster risk reduction, response, recovery, and reconstruction. Ministries, districts, non-governmental, and private organizations that will be part of the National Emergency Operations Center during an emergency activation. We would like to thank Ms. Michelle Forbes and her team at the National Emergency Management Organization for their leadership in the creation and refinement of the goals of this week's workshop and for their hospitality, both in hosting the workshop and towards our team during our time here at St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We would also like to thank the World Bank, including Elad Schenfeld, Decima Cora, and her, their team for sponsoring this week's workshop, which was co-financed by the European U Union funded Caribbean Regional Resilience Building Facility. The VEEP aims to assist SVG in its efforts for restoration, delivery of critical services, and resilient reconstruction in response to the April 2021 explosive eruptions of the Lassofrea volcano. The VEEP is financed by the World Bank through an International Development Association credit of U.S. $40 million and co-financed by the EU-funded Caribbean Regional Resilience Building Facility to the amount of approximately U.S. $2 million. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Teachers Union has signaled its intention to stage picket action as well as a march in Kingston. A press release from the SVGTU says that out of a meeting held last Friday, it was decided that several activities will be undertaken to stand in solidarity with teachers who were dismissed for refusing to comply with government's COVID-19 vaccine mandates. The union says the activities are to intensify action in light of government's invitation for dismissed teachers to reapply for employment. On Thursday, August 11th, a picket will be held in Kingston in front of the vegetable market and next Thursday, August 18th, a peaceful march will be held around Kingston. The union will also host a day of prayer at a date to be announced. The SVGTU as well as other trade union bodies are set to return to court later this year for the case brought against government which contests the dismissal of public servants. Police have arrested and charged a farmer of Overland with two counts of burglary. 37-year-old Lemon George was accused of entering the dwelling house of a 38-year-old preschool teacher of Gomi as a trespasser and stealing several electronic devices valued at $4,557 EC dollars on June 15th. He was also charged with entering the dwelling house of a 28-year-old domestic of Gomi and stealing several electronic devices and alcoholic beverages valued at $8,524 EC dollars. The items were stolen between the 15th and 16th of June. Charges were also laid against Akim De Silva for the offense of Wongdin. The 26-year-old farmer of Greenhill is accused of allegedly assaulting a 32-year-old janitor of Redemption Sharps by striking her on the left side of her back with a cutlass. The incident occurred at Greenhill at about 11.30 p.m. on August 8th. Both accused are expected to appear in the Kingston Magistrate Court to answer to the charges.